Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix Mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And today we'll look at something uh, extremely uh, practical. We will be looking at how to uh, work with the disposition parameter in MBS JCL. Of course, this applies for all versions of MBS, starting from OS 360, MVT, the uh, beloved MBS 3.8 that we have in TK4 or on the Moshix uh, MBS mainframe all the way through OS 390 and today's ZOS. It also applies uh, equally um, between JS2 and JS3. If you remember JS, uh, the job entry subsystem is kind of important in the mainframe world because uh, every old data is going to be analyzed, all the JCL is going to be analyzed before the job actually starts and JCL2 um, uh, just, sorry, JS2 will actually build all the control blocks before the job is started and JS3 is very similar. The only difference is that uh, the uh, reservation of the systems of the of the resources is done in JC, JS3 before the job starts, whereas in JS2 it's done at runtime. But other than that, the disposition parameter is, this, is the same. I also see that there's still a lot of confusion about the disposition parameter and what it does and what it's good for and how to use it. And so I thought that we'll make a very, very targeted video today to focus exclusively on the disposition parameter so that people once and for all can learn it and never have to worry about this uh, scary parameter again. So um, let's first start with uh, something that people know well, Windows or Linux. Whenever, you, whenever I create a file, I can just say echo Moshix YouTube new file.txt, right? And so if I just do it like this, what will happen is that a new file will be created and I will have, uh, of course, um, write access to it. And so now I can say type new file, where is it? Oops, what went wrong here? Oh, echo. And so now you see that it created a new file and, and, and put in the first line. Okay, so now if I do the same command again, but I put in um, hello 2019 and I write to the file again, of course, what will happen is that it overwrites it. It basically, it's almost like deleting the file and writing it from scratch. So the disposition of files in Linux and Windows are implied. That's the correct term to call it. So that if it, if it doesn't exist, it will be created and it will be created as a new file. And of course, registered within the directory. As you know, everything has a directory entry in either Windows or Linux, so we can find it. That is not the case in the MBS world where if a file can be cataloged, but it doesn't have to be. And so catalog is always something to consider extra uh, on top of all the other considerations about creating and handling a file in the MBS world. And, and when it's, from now on, every, say, every time I say MBS, I mean OS 390s, US, and any other uh, compatible system. So, um, so that is implied in, in the Unix and Windows world. Uh, I can, of course, choose to uh, say I append to a file because there is a notion that files may already exist. And so Mushik, Mushik's YouTube channel, if I do that, and if I look now at new file, we'll see that it can append. So the append is implied by the double greater than signs uh, attached here, right? So now what I can do is um, this way I create files, they're, imp they're implied, they're created implicitly, and appendage is also to file, adding at the bottom of a file is also uh, implicit. Now, there is also the notion that I need to, if I want to remove a new file, I can of course re remove it. If I try to remove a non-existing file, non-existing file, it will say it doesn't exist. So that is concerning the creation and appendage. And of course, as I said, registration in the Windows and Unix world is automatic within the directory entry. Now, what have, how is the locking handled, right? And so if I have, I think, several sessions here, so let me start. Well, actually, 
two mugs. Okay. Let's split. And so let's see if I can remember how to switch between windows. But if I now say I open this with Vim, which means you know, I want to open it to edit. And I, so if now it's open here for editing, obviously, and uh, just say I go here and I, uh, I want to add to it. Nothing, if I know, go here and let's go to the other pane um, and within Tmux here, within the other window, I can now say echo third line new file. So as you can see, nothing prohibits Linux or Windows to just overwrite another file. If I now do here type new file, um, what is it, new file dot text? Ah, where am I? Mm. So if I do more new file, we'll see that they just added another line. Now this guy doesn't know anything about it. So what this means is there is no locking, um, implicit locking in Unix or Windows. No implicit locking. That's key and very, very dangerous, of course, for a production system. Now, uh, there, you can do F, you can do some locking in Linux, for instance. I don't know about w Windows. I would suspect there is a little bit of more locking. Um, either you can do it programmatically within your software saying, before I access a file, I create a log file. Um, that's how it's often done in the Unix world. Um, although there is also a flock command, which uh, creates a lock. Okay, very few people know how to do it. So there's no really, there's no implicit locking. And as you can see here, Vim here still doesn't know that the file that it's editing has been updated. If I now do this uh, as the third line, it will just again over right now vim here is smart and says hey the file has been changed since reading it so vim is smart enough and it will just uh it will still write it again so it but it's the software that has to check for it it's not the operating system doesn't give you implicit locking within windows or or unix or linux all those kind of operating systems and that's kind of the posix um, um, standard so as you know file systems have and, and the operating system have to conform the POSIX standard to be to be something that people you know it's kind of like saying when you get into a new car you, you've been driving Fords all your life and now you want to drive a Mercedes you don't have to relearn the interface you know that the, the key switch is going to be somewhere in the right of the steering wheel in the in the let's say in North America where people drive on the on the right um, and uh, and that there's going to be a gear that you have to Kind of put in motion, and 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 the, the pedal on the right is going to accelerate, and the, and the braking pedal is to the left of that one. So it's kind of a similar. POSIX makes those kind of assumptions that you should be able to navigate any Unix or even Windows uh, file system with the knowledge that you already care uh, carry. Now MVS, of course, doesn't have any POSIX. Uh, even ZOS itself on the doesn't have POSIX compliance on the file system on the ZOS side. Of course, in the USS side of ZOS and OS 390, the Unix system services for ZOS, in there, there's it's POSIX compliant on the Unix file system within ZOS. But we're talking here about this position so that we're talking JCL where there's no POSIX compliance whatsoever. So this is how it works in, uh, in, in the uh, x86 world and in the POSIX world, uh, there's no implied locking. You have to kind of either do programmatically or start to use some kind of uh, um, operating system directives. Now, in the in the on the mainframe, of, however, of course, we all those things work differently. So that's why the, this parameter exists. I have here a simple job, which is just an IFBR14. As you know, IFBR14 is a very simple program that enters and immediately exits again, so it does nothing. And this is a very uh, handy program to use because it does nothing. And then you can use the JCL around it, let's say, to create a file uh, or a data set. So if I wanted to say um, new data set, then I could say here my data definition. And then I will give it a name, Moshix YouTube um, example. 
fun. You can have up to 44, including the dots. Remember, only up to 44 um, uh, bytes, uh, characters long, data set names, including all the dots in between within NBS. And then at some point, I will have to start coding the disposition. So disposition, as I was saying, handles what happens with the data set at creation. So I'm going to say creation, normal termination, and then abnormal, okay? I am running out of line here, event. Um, so, um, let's make a little space here. So, we code the disposition parameter for when we, when we uh, access it or during normal execution, what happens with it when we end normally, when the step, and this refers to the step, of course, when the step ends normally, and what happens with the data set when the step uh, terminates up normally, when they have an event. And so within that, um, you have these three possibilities. So here in the first one, you can either say new, which means you're creating it new, um, or you can have share, which means it already exists and you're able and you want to share it. But then you have to make sure that whoever is, that was only one, one job or one step uh, writing to that data set and all the others should be locked out. Old means that uh, it exists and is not to be changed. So this is gonna be for all the job, con all jobs consuming a data set, reading from it, but not writing to it. And this is the way that you make sure that your job doesn't, by mistake, write to a data set. So you should always make use of the disposition parameters in an intelligent way. A mod means it exists and, um, and I want to append to it, but this only works for sequential uh, data sets. So then we have um, the second step here, what happens with it uh, within normal termination. Usually you say keep, and that's implied. Um, sorry. Um, or if after you finish, delete it. So this is an effective way if you want to create a temporary data set that if you if you write here delete, it will uh, it will term it will delete it at the end of the step. Um, and then you can also say, of course, um, what I want to do with it. So if you want to catalog it or you want to uncatalog it. So those would, would be catalog or uncatalog. Uh, on catalog. Okay. And then you have the last part, which is abnormal, abnormal ending that the step uh, failed. And then you want to say either keep the same thing, keep, delete. Uh, usually you want to hear, when I say um, uh, delete, okay, um, or on catalog, whatever you need there. Um, and so um, on catalog, of course, doesn't mean it's actually done. done. It just on catalogs it. So you have to be careful when you, whenever you remove something from the catalog, it doesn't mean the data set is gone. You just uncatalog it. And that's different from Windows and Linux world. There, if you delete it, it's also automatically gone from the from the directory entry because of the whole inode structure. But here um, you have to know what you're doing. And so you have to study the disposition of the file carefully. It's almost the central part of every JCL job. And that's the first thing I always check is what is the disposition? What is the what is the author of JCL trying to do with this job, right? And so uh, I can do something like this, okay, uh, to my new file. Um, and then, um, and so this job here with the IFPR 14 would handle this way. Now, if I create a new file within MVS, I will also have to specify um, the DCB. So here we have to say DCB and then record format, right? Uh, you need to say uh, record length. You need to say things like um, block size, um, and and then um, BS org uh, like partitions. If you want to have it partitioned, organized, something like that. And then you also very often need to specify the unit. Let's say 3350 and the vol equals zero let's say pub 003, right? That would be a whole specification for new data set. So, and of course the DCB needs to be specified too. Um, later versions of MVS such as US 
have more automation around here than you would have here. But in MVS, uh, you still need to specify a lot of stuff there. So let's look at some examples. Um, yeah, here I have a, a, a job which dumps a, a, data, a, a whole disk. And here we say where it's coming from. So the, of course the unit, this position, uh, the, the, um, the volume serial, and then the disposition. And so in this case, the disposition is very important because I'm dumping a disk. So I want to have it old. So I only want, only want to read. And so I don't need the lock because I'm dumping it. And so otherwise, if I put it like in share, I would get into all kind of, uh, um, locking conflicts and by the way conflicts uh, or locking in MBS is called NQDQ because there's a macro for it so you can actually go and see uh, all locking activity if you go to our I'm one um, amazing monitor uh, you can see a reserve and NQ monitor right so E I can see all the current currently existing um, locks NQ means lock DQ means unlock. So I can see here there's some there's some user active here right now, this use user. And he is currently looking at season one command proc. And so there's a lock on that. Um, why he's using at that why is he looking at that file? I don't know. And but he's looking at it. Uh, sys one help. So let's see here who is active. Yeah, he's here. Send a message. User, let's just copy this. So he knows <laughs> he's being watched. Um, that's the beauty of uh, our online Moshix mainframe. There's users there, you can do fun stuff. It's not fun to run a whole mainframe in a single user. It's just not meant to be like that. So let's back again to our example. Um, and here, when we then write, dump the, the disk to, to a tape, I say unit tape, I need to give it a, a, a private label. And then this position catalog. So I disposition this as a new data set and I catalog on MBS, not on the tape, of course. So now MVS will know for eternity that there is this data set here on this tape and that connection is created. If you want to access this data set, it will say, I need this volume here, right? Standard label volume. So, um, so that's how this uh, works with the catalog in tapes. Uh, it's very important to know that if you write a, a data set to a tape and then throw that tape away or that file, it doesn't mean it's gone from the catalog. And I'm cataloging sometimes may actually require for the tape to be ready in again. I've seen that happen. Um, so here, let's look at data set, uh, DCB organization, right? If you create a new and want to catalog a file, so you create a file and then at the end of the step, you catalog it by normal termination. You need to specify the DCB, as we just said, data set, organization, PS, record format, fixed block of record length 80, block, lot, block size. So this is going to be a, a partition sequence. This is going to be a, a sequential data set because it's PS. If it was PO, it would be a partition data set. And then, of course, you need to specify the space parameter, how many tracks, right? And how many uh, primary tracks and how many of this. This refers to this, so 425 tracks. If you have cylinder sills, it will try to allocate cylinders. And how many secondary extensions. <coughs> and then release the... Um, and the release parameter at the end of the, for all the unused uh, space. And then you have the data set name only here. Okay. Um, so um, it's important to understand this block here very, very well. If you work with MBS, it's kind of, this is the bread and butter. You have to understand what's going on here. The volume serial, the unit. Uh, sometimes you can write here, sys, DA, if it's if it was specified like that, that's a an installation parameter, right? Uh, system uh, direct access. Uh, there's other names, um, and so even that this could be grouped by whatever you have in here. So you need to know exactly what's uh, what's going on there. 
and then the disposition as we said it, it's the most important part and that's why I actually when I write a new data set definition my preferred way is to have new start with the disposition because that is kind of given it's not going to change the, the data set name could be changed right uh, new catalog and then the data set name so that you also have know exactly how much space you have you need to change this is always going to stay right that's other people like to start with the data set name whatever but this is how i like to do it um, so anyway let's look at another example um by the way i heard from somebody that there was there were some viewers one or several viewers who said I go too fast lately in my videos and yes I guess it's true um, but you can always uh, freeze and unfreeze I know maybe it's not present pleasant to freeze and freeze on a on an iPhone or an iPad but these videos by the way are really meant to be viewed on a computer with a high resolution screen in a browser because it's so much more comfortable to stop unstop if you look at a browser and and the text is just so much bigger there's limits how big i can make the text because um it, it will just take too much space and it becomes unnatural to work if i make the fonts too big like uh, in this kind of thing right i mean i can make it um i can make it 24 but then look at this i mean it's maybe pleasant for you to look at but but there's really not much text i can put on a and this is a giant screen that i'm looking at it right so i think um uh, for this purpose of of uh ssh sessions i kind of have to restrict it to i think about 20. it's kind of the maximum right like this and then uh, i think it's still readable it still looks huge to me because i'm sitting I think about um, 20 inches from the screen right now because I also need to be close to the microphone. So this, it's the reality of making videos. You always have to think how it looks to other people, how you can work. But but I, I'll take the input that I may be going a little bit too fast. I'll try to, sl try, try to slow down. And I also know that when I kind of thinking and I know I'm being recorded because I'm making the video and I have to type i start to mumble a little bit maybe my language is not that clear anymore um i i i mean i don't i do have my own, own very particular pronunciation of of of, of uh, english um which is a mix of really uh <laughs> i lived in california for for years and i lived in the his coast for years and now i'm i'm down uh, down south in the u.s so I know that um, a lot of people not used to my accent, um, and uh, especially maybe people from Asia or for Europe. I'm sorry about all that. I'm trying my best. All right, so um, we said we'll look at some more examples. I have an example here where we see again. This is, uh, by the way, if you don't know this, uh, uh, this is the receive a job written by Michael Rayborn, I believe, that allows us to receive transmit packages uh what i mean is those packages here the one written like this xmit right um there's no um there is no interactive program for receive in the tso shell such as exists for zos but we have to use like a batch job same thing i mean and even on zos the the uh, receive can also be invoked in batch of course so uh but what we're looking at here is this is the job I used to import kicks, which is the CICS equivalent for TSO. And here you see how we deal again with the with the uh, disposition. Okay, very good example. New, delete, delete. Okay, so remember the first one uh, says what happens at creation when the job gets started. The second one says what happens on normal termination of the step, which means the step finishes and moves on to the next step. Or if it's the last last step, then of course it's the end of the job, and then the last one, delete, means what happens to the, to this data set if if there is an abnormal termination. So he wants here, <coughs> or I want it because I think I wrote this JCL. Uh, I wanted it to be created, and I want it to be deleted in both cases. So it's really a temporary data set. That's what it all means. So this thing here is a temporary data set. Um, and then, uh, well, actually not this one, but the step 
this is like a temporary data set used by receive 370 and so we wanted of course because it's a temporary data set just for this execution of this one instance of receive 370 we want it to be uh, deleted anyway at the end of the step whether it's successful or not so that makes sense and then let's look here at the dcb a little bit um well there's no dcb but there's a space parameter which is strictly speaking no part of the space of the dcb parameter and it says we allocate 300 tracks 60 additional tracks in case we run out and it doesn't say release here um uh, because the data set so it means that if we close the data set and don't use all the tracks in this case or some of this or whatever then it would release those that's what release rlse means right it's uh i'm gonna write like this rl rlse right but there's no need to write it here so you kind of need to understand all how all this parameter have relationship to each other because if i'm deleting it doesn't matter right um because i'm always going to delete this data set so that's why we kind of close it like that um, in this case so you can't just take formulaic uh pros and just copy it in here you have to understand the relationship between the dcb the disposition and the space parameter right the, those things are kind of important and uh, and if it if you don't make it work um, you will always have suboptimal um, execution of your jobs in the worst case you litter your dasties with 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 data sets that will take you many hours of work to clean up afterwards because you'll have to find out is it used what is it used for so um, you know be responsible understand what the disposition parameter does what the dcb does and how the space parameter works and all this gets together now in zos if you happen to run in zos things get a little bit more complicated because you have um uh managed storage right um you have something called dfs ms i think which is managed storage and in managed storage a lot of things that we know from mvs uh jcl don't work like that anymore because it's managed storage so for instance temporary data sets are handled differently you sometimes cannot uncatalog stuff at all because it needs to know where it is uh, because uh, managed storage may decide one day to move some data sets over to tape on its own right it's fully automated so and and i have a video here in my in my youtube channel where i talk about differences between differences between mbs and zos and i say mbs is a lot more elegant yes because i and i think i mentioned in the video that managed storage um it's kind of a bolt-on thing that makes that negates a lot of the principles around around mvs uh, from earlier on and uh, and so if you work with zos you need to you need to be aware that you're working with managed storage for a lot of the DASDs. not all DASDs are assigned to managed storage but if they are a lot of the stuff in the jcl just works differently and so uh, there is really no work around to reading the manual in the mainframe world. You can watch uh, YouTube videos all you want, but eventually, I guess you will have to sit down and and read some manuals. And because things are different sometimes, and and there is there is a finesse to how things work together. Okay, let's see if we can find another example. All right, so here is a job. Uh, data set audit facility something I installed on the mainframe uh, MBS uh, on the on the cloud MBS mainframe um, um, so here you see what is this when there is no tracks being uh, specified space JCL parameter so I know but let's go read it let's find out what it really means <coughs> Sorry about the cough. No, it's not pleasant. So um, here's a good example, right? So here we talk about block length, right? If we don't specify anything. And here we say that um, we will have so this is this, this thing that's most similar to this one 
the space allocation find that is overridden by space and average rec. So this is an override which indicates an average record length of 128 bytes. So when you don't specify tracks or cylinders, it's a record length. Okay, that's also something you need to know. Not all, you don't always specify records or cylinders, sometimes just records. And if you take a record, then where does it take the record length from? Well, from the DCB. And, and something to understand in MBS is that the DCB, there's always a DCB, right, for every data set. And it can be specified in three things. And wherever they specify, they have to all agree with each other. And so it can either be specified in the program that you're writing, right? Um, if you look at some of the programs I've written in Assembler, um, where am I? Do I have a DCB here? Nope. Uh, do I have a DCB here? Nope. I believe I have. A DCB here? No. No. Uh, there may be potentially. Um, find DCB. Yeah. So the DCB can be specified in the program, in the program source itself, the program that you have. And then you can even have record format, block size, uh, record length, record <coughs> the length of record. All those things can be specified here. And then you can also specify it as we saw in the JCL. And um, right, if you specify it in the JCL, it cannot be. Oops, sorry. Mm, there's no JCL here, but. Uh, let's go back here. If you do specify it here, it needs to be the same as in the program source. You can't have conflicting DCBs. And then finally, there's a DCB known in the catalog. And so these three things, the, the program source or whatever, because you're always executing some program, right? That's why you execute a job. So whatever is in the program needs to, and then you can also specify it in the JCL, and it can also spe and it can also be written in the catalog. And all those don't have to be, but they can. But if they are, they need to be exactly the same. And if they're not, you're going to get an event, and those can re can result in all kinds of event. Uh, usually, 500 series of events, or or sometimes even uh, even a zero C7 can be in a, a a problem with the DCB. So zero C uh, series kind of events which often are addressing or or um, divide by zero kind of events but those can also be the result of a wrong dcb um, and so a wrong dcb will manifest itself in many many ways um, and sometimes they're easy to debug some sometimes they're not um, so be aware that um, the dcb is something that's kind of important and you need to know exactly what is the DCB for the file? What is the description of that file? Now, again, in the Unix and Windows world, we never have to worry about those things because fly files and data sets on Unix are allocated implicitly. The sharing is implicit. That you can do uh, file locking. You can even do record locking, but it's not very good. It's very, very weak record locking. And the disposition parameters, everything, it's, it's really what the use is that's called disposition. What is the use of the data set in this particular job, in this particular instance? Once a data set can be disposition mod because you're writing into it, appending to it. In another use case, the same data set further down the job chain, it could be just old because you're just reading from it. It could be shared because you're writing to it. So understand the disposition, the DCB, the space parameter, and then the underlying file system, such as on ZOS with the DFSHMS, uh, so managed storage, those all those things kind of um, work together. There is no replacement for reading the manual. There's no replacement for experience. All I'm doing in this video is kind of kicking, you know, kicking the, kicking the stone, kind of the, the boulder a little bit downhill so you start thinking about all these things. What is this? Here again. DSORG, which is data organization, this is uh, partition sequential fixed block, record length 80, block size 3200. 
we had a whole video where we discussed block sizes. You need to be very efficient with those. You understand, you need to understand what kind of device it is. So is this a good allocation, uh, block size allocation for pub uh, 002? Well, let's go check. I don't remember what pub is. Um, uh, there is a command to show volumes. What is it again? Um, uh, well, we can also just, just always go. So uh, let's go see what is pub 002. Okay. So that's um, pub 002, I believe, is a 3380. So, what is the um, um, block size calculation for 30, IBM 3380? Okay, there's some websites. Um, don't go to the IBM, it's nothing. I, the IBM web support websites only reflects very, very modern stuff. So you want to go to some stuff that's a little bit older. Um, so here's the formula, obviously. And by the way, I do have, if I go just to GitHub, uh, Moshex, and go to the MBS uh, repository, I have a whole Go language program ready assembled to run on Linux. That calculates the ideal, uh, the ideal uh, block size for any kind of disk that existed in the history. So it goes from, you can see here, 2311s, 2314s, up to 339093. So it will calculate the ideal block size. But so you can just download it and run. And it's written in Go language. Um, it has an extensive help facility. It's a whole little program that I wrote in Australia last week, uh, sorry, not last week, last year. Um, so, um, let's see here. So, you can see here how this is all calculated. And so, this is form here, by the way, folks. There's this forum here, ibmainframes.com, and I really don't understand the purpose of this mainframe. People ask questions because they don't know answers, and the people say, read the manual. Well, <laughs> if I read the manual, then why do I need to go to your website? Why can people in the mainframe community not, not just be uh, friendly to each other? Why do we have to continue this awful, awful tradition of, uh, of the mainframe world where information is power, and so you have power through information obfuscation? That doesn't that doesn't work anymore in in the modern world. You know, Windows and Unix and Linux changed all that. You want to be if you know an answer, uh, I would suggest these people write an answer. Why why even make it hard? Uh, here somebody wrote the whole Rex program. So anyway, but nobody really answers him, right? And so uh, let's find out what is the best allocation size. There's some used to be some websites. Okay, here somebody wrote the whole. Uh, block size calculator it's been removed oops so here it is so 3380 okay um, bytes per track record length 80 and you get this is the ever this is the best block size 23440 I know that number by heart but just showing you how you can calculate it I can use my program 23440 is the best block size for 80 on a 3380 so if you go there, back to my little, oops, where, where are we, uh, was it, where do we have uh, was it this one, I don't remember, but uh, so in that case we had the 3380, I think it was this one. Yeah, um, you see, pub 002 is a 3380. It has this many tracks per bytes per track. So therefore, the best block size for 80 will be not 3200, but actually would be 2344, uh, 440. 
Right? This will be the ideal. If you have any less, you will waste a lot of space. So think about these things and understand how to work because it makes you just a much better uh, programmer and even a better system programmer if you understand those things. That's all I really wanted to show. Um, again, you should maybe download my uh, MBS um, repository or GitHub and there's a ready, ready um, compiled Ready, ready to run binary for Linux. Uh, this could also be made to run very easily in Windows because Go language runs and the, the C there's almost no dependence, it's just flag and format. Um, that runs just equally well on any platform where Go language runs, including Android and all that kind of stuff. And this is what it gave you. We will give you 23440 uh, for 80. Just remember that. For, if you have 80 record size and the 3380, 23440, it's not hard to remember. So that's it. Uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Just, just uh, start to, um, you know, encourage you to think uh, and to learn a little bit more about that stuff. And uh, and uh, if you have any other questions about JCL, then please post them. Uh, post the questions as comments below this video. I will uh, point again to this file here on uh, in the description below this video. If you have any other topic you want me to cover or anybody else that's active in the channel then uh, please uh, post some comments below this video. If you like this particular uh, video, then do press on the thumbs up button. It's kind of important to keep the channel visible to the search engines, as well as plenty of comments. Comments are very important for the search engines to pick up stuff. And finally, if you haven't subscribed to the Motion Explain Frame channel yet, then please do subscribe now. Thank you for watching and see you around. Thank you, goodbye.